welcome. If you're in the northwest, you're here. Well done. Thank you very much for turning up. If you are watching online, um, I hope you've managed to find some food and get together. Um, I'm Steve. Uh, I head up Eden with Sarah. I've got a very important job of letting you know a few things that are going on. First one is we have Teams Day. So if you're new to Eden, this happens every single year. Uh, if you're not, then you should know. And it's going to be on the 18th of November, so that's Saturday. Uh, it's just for us. No one else is invited. Um, so all your teams, uh, you can bring kids. Um, it's kind of everyone together here, 18th of November. So if it's not in your diary, make sure it is. Uh, and it's going to be a great day, it always is. Uh, next is proximity, um, which we, we let some of the people come to that. Uh, and there's been a, a slight change in date, I say slight, kind of by about a month. Uh, it's usually in May, but this next year, it says 23rd, I think, uh, I mean 2023, 2024, uh, it's going to be 14th to 15th of June, uh, and again, that's going to be here. Um, can we book in yet? No, don't book in yet, but put it in your diary so you don't forget. Um, thirdly, we've just had a lovely weekend in Blackpool. Uh, if you like Blackpool or even if you don't, there's a wonderful guest house there called the Flints, um, headed up by a couple who used to be part of the Eden Network and they take in um, pretty much anybody uh, and are wonderful and it's a great place to get some respite and if you've got neighbours who might not um, usually get away or need a bit of support on holiday, then look them up um, and we can give you some more information later. Finally, uh, we have just put a, a new job out for Eden HQ called uh, Relationship Manager. That's what we're looking for. Um, so if you know anyone who might be interested in that, then speak to me or Sarah and have a look on the message website and find the job. I think that I've done everything. I think so. Share it. Oh, yeah, share it on social media. Otherwise, people won't know. Um, great. I'm going to introduce Sarah, uh, who's going to come speak to us. So I'm going to pray first. Uh, Father, um, I don't know what everyone else's day has been like, but um, we just want to put things down now and um, just to slow down and to connect with you, connect with each other, uh, and to give you ourselves again. Help us be in alignment with you uh, and in step with your spirit. And pray for Sarah as she speaks to us, that you would speak through her, that we'd be listening, um, and that you'd speak right into our situations. In Jesus' name. Amen. Great. Sarah Small. Thanks. I did think, but well, me and Steve don't actually communicate very often, but I thought at some point it'd be quite nice to do this as an actual double act. And like, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that the message sometimes Andy and Sam stand up together and do like Q&A stuff. And it's quite funny. But I don't know if we'd make it funny. <laughs> it might just be awkward. But we will take some questions um, at the end tonight if we have some time. Um, because what I really want to do tonight um, is just spend a little bit of time refreshing uh, your memory, refreshing uh, your spirit, hopefully, um, about what it is to be part of Eden. I think this September is the start of a new year for us at The Message. It's the start of a new year for many people if they kind of go by the school academic year. And I think sometimes um, we can get so busy doing stuff or we can get so familiar with what it is that we're doing that we can sort of ever so slightly lose sight of why we're doing what we're doing uh, and who we're doing it for. So at the beginning of this new year, I just felt like I wanted to spend a little bit of time refreshing, revisiting. Uh, and if that causes you to ask any questions or have anything that you want clarified, then please um, Jot that down, note that down, write that in the chat if you're on YouTube. Um, and we'd love to um, try and get some answers to you either tonight or if we can't answer them, because it's possible that we don't have all the answers. Um, I don't think I have all the answers all the time, it's true. Don't tell my children that because I'd tell them otherwise. But um, but yeah, it's possible we don't. But that's, that's what I'd really love us to kind of get tonight from our session. 
Um, I'm aware that across the network we have got heaps of new people who've joined us. So um, this is for you guys as well by way of kind of induction into the network because sometimes we do these trainings and we look at all sorts of topics but it's good just occasionally and particularly at the end of the year to come back to the why. Why are we doing this? Uh, what is the DNA of Eden? What's really unique about how we do what we do? Uh, yeah, so we're going to ask a bunch of questions. And if you are watching at home or you're watching on catch up, then you might want to pause and look at those questions in time. If you're in the room, then they'll just come up on the screen, maybe take a photo of them, and you can revisit them with your teams when you have a little bit of time at a later date. Um, but the first couple of questions, really, that we want to ask is why does Eden exist? And that's kind of Eden the network. And why does your Eden team exist? And it's good just to spend some time with your team or with your church leadership or with your pal, uh, depending on the size of your team, um, just asking those questions. Why do we do what we do? Why do we move into communities? Why do we share our faith? Why do we pray for people? Why do we run this kids group? Why do we run that outreach? Why are we involved in this specific way of doing things? Often we just get so busy doing stuff, we don't ask the question why. Often when people look at Eden, they look at a lot of our stories, don't they? They see what we do uh, and, and they can kind of make all sorts of judgments and make all sorts of ideas about what it is. But sometimes uh, that isn't a full reflection of what we're trying to do. So it's good uh, for all of us who are part of Eden to know why are we doing this? Why are we called? I did a little exercise with our Eden team leaders. We go away a couple of times a year couple of times a year on residential and we spent a bit of time looking at why do we do this thing um, and some of the answers that we got were because because Jesus calls us to because he called me specifically to and you might have had that experience of calling God might have laid Eden on your heart he might have made it impossible for you to resist the many asks that you had to come and join this crazy movement he might have put some people in your church who said come and do this thing come and be part of this it might have been someone years and years ago we're a movement that's 26 years old. We are really the second and third generation of Eden in this room. There are not many people who are part of the network now who really have first-hand knowledge of the beginning and the early days of what we did. And it's good even now to cast our minds back to the reasons that we got started at the beginning. But before I do that, I just wanted to tell you about another book that I've been reading. So I like to read books occasionally. And sometimes I don't read the books. I just read reviews of them online. <laughs> uh, and and um, there's some really good sites that give you like, um, what do you call it? Like summaries. That's what I'm talking about, summaries of books. Uh, and there's a book that I've been reading recently, or reading summaries of and the beginning of, called Mission Drift. And I think this is something that I really want us to avoid as a network. If you've heard this phrase before, mission drift, it's about um, basically saying without intentional attention, faith-based organizations can drift from their founding mission. Slowly, silently, and with little fanfare, organizations routinely drift from their purpose. It's something that always happens because people are involved, because ideas get passed down from generation to generation. And sometimes it just takes a few small changes for an organization to completely change track. It's a little bit like if you're trying to walk in a straight line from A to B. If you just take a little sidestep and a little sidestep and a little sidestep, suddenly you're no longer going towards B, you're going towards N or some other, <laughs> some other number. It, small changes uh, in the moment can lead to quite big changes of direction. And I think it's good for us as an organization, as a group, as a network, as a bunch of friends, as family on mission to pay attention, to avoid that. And it, the book talks about organizations that are mission true. So organizations that stay true to their core DNA, their core values. And it says this, in its simplest form, mission true organizations know why they exist and protect their core at all costs. They remain faithful to what they believe God has entrusted them to do. They define what is immutable, their values and purpose, their DNA, their heart and their soul. 
And I hope if you're in the room tonight, I hope if you're watching tonight, something of the DNA, something of the heart and soul of Eden has captured you. I hope that you didn't just get asked to come along by somebody and you thought this sounds like a good idea and a nice way to spend a Monday night. I hope that it's a little bit more than that because um, because Eden is is it is a DNA. It's a it's um it's a way of thinking. It's a way of being. And yeah, it's a vehicle as well. It's a way of helping people. Um, engage in mission and I uh, what please hear me right I don't want to kind of elevate Eden above the gospel I'm not trying to go there I'm not trying to kind of blow our own trumpet and say aren't we amazing and isn't this the only way to live but what I'm trying to say is what we're trying to do as a as a as a movement as a network is be intentional and to create a DNA and to be a people of heart and to be a people who are on mission together The book goes on to say, mission true organizations do not apologize for their Christian identity. They see their shared faith as an asset to their mission. It's what makes their organizations distinct in the industry and becomes the characteristic they celebrate more than any other. The gospel is not cursory within mission true organizations. It's more than just a motivation. It is central. Everything else hinges around it. And I think that's often the point of greatest contention, isn't it, when it comes to our work on the ground, keeping the gospel central. There's so many people that we want to partner with who would say to us, oh, we'd love you to come and do some stuff with us. We'd love you to be part of this group. We'd love you to reach this this young person. We'd love to help you with this. But could you just kind of, you know, play down that gospel? Could you just leave that bit out? Could you just you know, keep a bit quiet on that. And, and and it can be tempting, you know, all these funders who are out there, they say, you know, we'll fund you to do face-to-face youth work. We'll fund you to deliver a warm space. We'll fund you to be part of a food bank. But can you just keep the faith bit on the down low? Can you just keep the gospel bit quiet? Because that can get a bit offensive. That can get a bit divisive. That can get a bit icky sticky. And we, we don't really, and we can become kind of feeling like we're on eggshells sometimes around people and, and trying to play politics and and I think it's good to remember that we are gospel people it's central to who we are it's central to the core of Eden it's what God calls us as Christians to be about bringing in his kingdom declaring his gospel his good news in word and in deed and I and I think it's worth um I hope I'm not coming across like preachy like telling you off preachy here I'm just I it's just stuff that I'm passionate about and I feel like I want to at this opportunity just bring it out and some of it's just coming out and some of it's written down and uh, you might not notice the difference but um what I want to say is that, that the gospel isn't that what he says here is more than just a motivation we, you know the gospel does motivate us to love our neighbor the gospel does motivate us to go the, the, the extra mile but it's also central the gospel is actually the only thing that's going to transform people's lives I am by nature a fixer and um, I realised this yesterday when I had a chat with a lady at, at church. I went to Blackpool to, uh, to Beacon Church in Blackpool yesterday. And I had a lovely chat with a lady after the service. Fascinating uh, lady, really challenging life and all sorts of stuff going on. And inside my head, I was just like, if you just did this, if you just did that, if you just got some prayer, if you just experienced this, if you just knew freedom. And like my little brain was going crazy. And I'm sure that you have these experiences as well because I just want to see people fixed I just want to see them healed I just want to see them set free I just want to see them forgiving the people around them and not living in hate and not living in pain and it's come home to me recently I've got a friend um who sadly took his own life in the last few months and um and I thought he was fine. I thought he was living a great life. I thought he was happy. He was part of a, you know, a really strong community. He had some faith stuff going on. And I just thought he was okay. But he was harboring so much bitterness in his heart. And I never challenged him on it because I was just a bit like, you know, his friendship was more important to me than, than kind of speaking some of that hard stuff into his life. And I knew that he knew a bit about church because we'd used to go to youth group together when we were kids, but he'd kind of gone on a different spiritual journey and I was in my head a bit like, well, maybe that's, you know, for him and that's cool. And and there's so many excuses, isn't there, not to be 
challenging to people, not to share your faith, not to, to, to bring that moment of clarity into a situation, not to say things like forgiveness is possible, like reconciliation is achievable and actually you are valuable and lovable and worth something and I didn't say those things and now I'm sure many of you have been in a similar situation you go over the tapes in your head and I know that I couldn't have done much different to what I did but it just it it spurs me on to be more passionate about taking the opportunities that remain in front of me and sharing with the people that I know are still hopeless and yeah I'd love to see them fixed and I know I can't fix them I know it's on God so it's that act of pointing people to him it's that act of praying for people it's that act of declaring freedom over them and using your words and the power of your words and the power of your testimony and the power of this collective as well it's not just a one of us job is it that's why we're part of a network. That's why we operate in teams because we need to cover each other when it gets tough and we need to support each other when people are consistently, persistently not yet sorted. None of that was in my notes, but I just felt like to share it with you. The gospel is central. Everything hinges around it. And each of us, I think, also needs to just occasionally revisit what the gospel is to us I think it's really easy to become the professional Christian it's really easy to be the stereotype of the Christian in your community the one that people look to the one who is reliable and dependable and sorted and has it all together and about three weeks ago I went to a little bible study that happens in the cafe that we run on Merseybank and there was a couple of women running it. I wasn't actually part of running it. And they said to me, how's your week been? And I had two choices. My choices were I could go, oh, yeah, it was great. I've had a fine week. Kids back at school, busy at work, all going really well. Or I could tell them about my friend who's just died and the fact that I don't really know what I'm feeling about that and I'm finding it really challenging. And he was my age and all of that stuff. So I went for that one because I thought it's good to be real. It's good not to have it all sorted and not to be fixed and not to have it all together sometimes and to be a bit vulnerable and to open up to people even though that feels a bit scary because you feel like you're supposed to have it all sorted. But the reality is we're all on a journey with God still, right? We haven't got all the answers. We're not fixed. We're not sorted. And there's still more work in each of us for God to do. And he can do that through our communities, not in spite of them. Sometimes we feel like, if I could just get away from them, if I could just go, I feel like this all the time. I look around other Christian ministries and think, where can I go and like get sorted and then you know come back? But God doesn't often parachute us out, does he, to get sorted. He likes to sort us out in the mix so everyone else can watch, which is always a bit icky and a bit painful, and I don't like it. But, um, but there we go. Right, where am I going? There's a bunch more questions that we could ask ourselves as we start to examine what is Eden and what is our Eden team for. We can ask questions about what did God call us into? You know, each of us has been on a journey with Eden for a period of time. So what did God call you into? Was it into setting up the team in the first place? Was it to join the team as it has been going for some time? Was it to be a different kind of voice in a team where everybody looks and feels and sounds unlike you? What did God call you into? It's useful to think about our expectations. What did you expect might happen? At Proximity, I talked a little bit about some of the... um, the sins of Eden or the pitfalls of Eden. And I talked about a whole list of things that we can kind of quite easily uh, take on board. We can, we can quite easily become a bit judgmental in a kind of inverse way. We can become inverse snobs. So if there's anyone in church who's really well-to-do and they've got a lovely car and they seem to have it all together, we can be a bit condescending, can't we? And say, oh, it's all right for them. They're not really doing the real stuff though, are they? If they were doing what we did, then, you know, and we can go down that line, can't we? Um, and one of the other things where am I going I've totally lost my train of thought sins of Eden nope totally gone anyway well I was talking about all the different things that we could do inverse snobbery um, comparison to other Christians and and really we can we can get ourselves stuck in a mindset that's not healthy when God is calling us to be just people on a journey with him, just people who are working and walking this faith thing out together. So 
What did we expect might happen? That's where I was, expectations. Sometimes when we start eating, our expectations are super high. We expect that we're going to join an amazing team where everyone's going to be just like us. And we're going to pray until three o'clock in the morning every day. And we're going to see each other on the school run every morning. And we're going to have freshly baked cakes on a Sunday. And, you know, all of our expectations can get heightened into this like cloud of glory. And and, and it's going to descend and everyone's going to get saved. And I know I'm caricaturing it a bit but there'll probably be a little bit of grain of truth for each of us in some of that because our expectations are high but what did we expect would happen when we set out on this journey when we joined Eden what did we expect we might learn what did we expect we might see how did we expect to feel I imagine all of those things have been challenged as you've walked this journey ask the question what's happened over the time we do like an annual review for all of our Eden teams we try and get it done uh, around a year after the team has been formed and then every year from that point onwards and we ask those sorts of questions what's happened this year what's going on what's been great what's been challenging how can we pray how can we dig into some of the stuff how can we support you and bless you and love you and vice versa what have you learned that we can bring to the rest of, of this group the rest of this network that's one of the blessings of being together how do we feel about it it's often worth checking how we feel sometimes because sometimes we feel a bit different to how we think we feel sometimes I don't know if you've ever experienced that you, you're recounting a story and you realize you're a little bit more angry than you thought you actually were or you're a little bit more frustrated than you thought you were or sometimes a bit more passionate than you thought you were but how did those things make you feel spend some time with those questions with your team um, on a regular basis just thinking through um what God called you into, your expectation level, what he's done. And sometimes we can be really, we can verge on the negative and we can be like, God's done nothing. God's not turned up here. God's not met my expectations. And then we have to sit back and ask him that question, what have you done? Where have you been working? Because I refuse to believe he does nothing. If you're there and you're praying something's going on you just might not be seeing it yet or you might not be seeing it because you're looking for something else so pray and say to him what are you doing reveal it to me open my eyes open my ears what are you doing that I just haven't caught sight of because I'm so busy looking for something else so let me give you a little rundown of the Eden story particularly for those of you who are new um, but a refresher for anybody who's not We began in 1997, which is 26 years ago now, uh, as old as some of you in the room and possibly older than some of you younger ones and definitely younger than some of us as well. And Eden really arose as the answer to a question. And the question was posed by um, a situation that we'd got ourselves into as the message. So as you may or may not know, the message uh, had these bands, they go into schools and they do concerts and these bands were like trying to do the gospel in cool ways and sing songs and do presentations and Andy Hawthorne used to rap and um, at the time it was compelling, like people loved it. You look back now and Google it and look on YouTube and it's it's a wonderful and eye-opening and terrifying thing all in one. But, it, but people came to faith. People heard the gospel, particularly young people, in their schools. And they'd come to these concerts. And they'd respond in the moment. And they'd hear something of this. They'd get under the sound of the gospel, we might say. They'd hear something of truth and of hope and of life. And they'd want it. But then they couldn't realize the depth of that when they got out when they got out of that arena, when they were out of school, when they were just doing life in community. So the question that we asked ourselves was, what would it take for these young people to be connected to a local church, to be discipled, to really understand what it meant to become a Christian and to stay a Christian and to live as a Christian going forward? And it really helped me when I read some of that stuff to kind of begin to see why we, why we started What would it take? It would take a bunch of people, passionate, young, trendy in some instances, not always. I think we've probably moved away from that a little bit. I count myself very much in the non-trendy zone. Um, But people who wouldn't just sing and rap about the gospel on a stage, 
but people who would talk about the gospel on the streets, people who would chat about the gospel on their doorstep, people who would be down the shop and could talk to you about the gospel, people who'd be running the youth club and could talk to you about the gospel. It was persistent, consistent witness. It wasn't big stage one-offs. It was regular, every day, walk in the walk, life on life, discipleship. And that's why we started Eden, because we wanted to get Christians to infiltrate communities where the churches were struggling to make the connection. Christians to infiltrate communities where the churches were struggling to make connection. And often I've talked about Eden as being a bridge, a bridge between communities and churches, a way that people can move in both directions. Because yeah, we want people to come into the church, but more often than not, we need the church to get out of the church and to get into the community and to get over fear and to get over stereotypes and to get over this is the way we do things and they have to stay this way forevermore. And some of our church partners have been incredibly courageous when it comes to doing that. And some of our church partners have really wanted to be courageous in doing that. And we've had to work through some of the challenges that joining with Eden has has made for them. And when we get new partners, I quite often say to them, and I, I feel like I'm not a very good salesperson because I basically say to them, I don't know why you want to do this because it's going to mess up your church and it's going to make things difficult and your safeguarding office is going to have a nightmare and your youth workers are going to get like, all sorts of hassle because they've got these lovely Christian kids on one side and then they've got all these other kids on the other side and you're going to find yourself out four nights a week and you're going to find yourself despairing and they're like, oh, you know, ooh, we'll call you back. <laughs> it's quite a good way to, to sift out, you know, are we called to this? Do we actually want to reach communities? Do we actually want to see life on life, year on year, decade on decade witness in our communities? Because one of the things that we are passionate about is commitment to community. We want people to stay long term. We used to sign people up on a contract back in the day. We don't really do that anymore, mainly because I'm not that hot on paperwork. But we used to sign people up to a minimum of five years. And you would sign on the dotted line, I'm joining Eden for five years. I think in the early days, it might have even been for ten. Because we were like, take such a long time to get trust and community to get the opportunity to share to not just be seen as like the local Christian weirdo I think we're probably still seen as the local Christian weirdos in our community but but it takes time that's why we're committed to longevity in our communities so we moved a bunch of passionate Christians into Bench Hill 26 years ago what's happened since then well we've done it again and we've done it again and we've done it again you guys are all proof of that you guys are all proof of that Over the last 26 years, we've sent 850 people to live in communities. And they might have moved hundreds of miles. They might have not moved at all in terms of their postcode, but just made a shift in terms of their practice and their theology and their focus. That's 78 teams over the time since we've launched. And, you know, I I like to know what's going on, so I'm telling you what's going on. Of those 78 teams, there are about 25 that are still active the majority of those are up north, northeast and northwest, and Yorkshire being the, the kind of stronghold these days. And then we've got Nottingham, we've got Cardiff, we've got London, we've got Glasgow, um, and we might have one in the West Midlands coming up. And we've got a few in Canada that we're kind of, we're a bit more like cousins with Canada at the moment. We're kind of working on the relationship and bringing it in, and vice versa. Hoping for a trip to some of these international places, actually, at some point. I'll just say that now. It's nice coming to all of you as well, though. Much more manageable. But yeah, 25, 26 years of planting teams and of raising up missionaries. And what have we seen change over the last 25, 26 years? Well, absolutely tons of stuff. I mean, housing for once. You know, back in the early days, we used to have rows of houses just empty. Can you imagine that now in our communities? It's impossible. There is a housing shortage that is chronic in our nation. And it feels like a challenge sometimes to move a Christian family in when a needy family could have that house. Like it's an actual dilemma that we have to kind of process a bit as Eden. Uh, There isn't so many people who are knocking on our door saying, move me to the toughest community in the nation. And we don't have uh, so much of a platform for raising those people. It's a high bar. We know that. And yet we're not really going to be doing much about lowering it. 
because I don't think that's the way forward. Because I still want people who join Eden to want to be part of something for the long term. I still want people who join Eden to want to be in a local church, to want to be giving their time over and above, to want to be opening their homes in hospitality, to want to be praying regularly for their estate, with their estate, to want to be raising up local leaders, to want to be setting people free to reach their neighbours and friends. I still want people to be doing that. So I don't want us to lower the bar and say, it's okay if you just come for half an hour a week and you can be a core part of what we do yeah you can support us that's great but if you're on Eden if you're part of this if you've read the team member job description and filled in the form and been through the interview and done the prayer journal then I don't want you to be thinking what's the least I can give and how long will I manage to do this for I want you to be thinking I'm in this until the Lord says otherwise. I'm in this to be molded and shaped as he wants to mold and shape me. I'm in this to be used as he wants to use me. And I'm sticking here until such a time as he says otherwise. And we, I ask that question every now and then. Steve just went to this prophetic conference up in Scotland the other week. And the first question I asked him when he came back was, did God say we're moving? He was like, no, he didn't. I was like, great. Because I don't want to move. Not just because moving's a pain, but just, I, like, I actually have nightmares sometimes that we have to leave our estate and we have to say goodbye to all these people that we've invested in. And maybe I'm just a weirdo, but I hope that some of you have some of that. Like, you just love the place. You just want to stay. You don't want to lower the expectation level. You don't want to lower the bar. You want to play this game for the long term. Eden's become a voice over the years as well. And one of the things that's happened in recent times uh, is that we've launched something called the Proximity Network. It's really only just got legs in the last few months. And um, we've employed Tom Grant. So many of you will know Tom. He used to lead the Eden team in Netherton. He's a bit of an Eden legend. And he's come to join um, the message. He's working with Teresa, who headed up our work in London for a number of years and was part of Eden in Labrook Grove. And the two of them are working to extend what we've been able to do as Eden. They're working to support all sorts of people who either want to do urban mission or are doing urban mission through creating resources. And we'll hear more about that over the years. It's still, it's still early days. But we've been able to develop a platform that's going to speak wider than we can, go deeper than we can, and reach more people than we can, which is really exciting. And I think there's still more that we can do with our voice as Eden as well. I think we can still speak more prophetically. I think we can still speak more politically. I think we can still speak more consistently to the church. One of the things that has changed over the last 25 years is that the church has started to see that urban places are places that they need to be planting churches. There are many different church planting streams and denominations and programs out there at the moment, and some of them are doing a great job of getting into urban communities. And I'd like to hope that if they're not doing it in partnership with us, we can still cheer each other on, and we can still support them, and we can still lend some of our years of wisdom and experience and give them some of our mistakes so they don't have to make them all themselves. Okay, I've got 10 more minutes I'm going to speak for and then we'll do some questions. We've got five cornerstones and five distinctives as Eden. If I was being really like mean, I would ask you what they were because obviously you all know it, right? You've got it all written on your walls and <laughs> you know this stuff. But it just explains how we do what we do. So why do we do Eden? Because we're passionate about seeing people experience life on life, day on day, committed discipleship in communities. We're passionate about seeing the kingdom of God break in. We're passionate about this Jesus who left heaven and moved into the neighborhood. You know, those kind of scriptures that we hang on to. Scriptures like um, the Ezekiel scripture that we uh, use regularly, which I know off the top of my head, but I'm still going to read it from my notes. Ezekiel 36, 35, the land that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. That scripture that shows a picture of the transformation of a place, as well as the transformation of a people, as well as the transformation of an individual. Believing that God is about transformation at every level. 
So why and how do we do what we do? Well, we always do it in partnership with a local church. All of you will be part of one of our churches. Um, and some of those are church plants. Some of them are established churches. Some of them are churches that need a bit of TLC. Some of them are churches that are on fire for the Lord. And it's, it's a whole spectrum of church. But we believe that church is the vehicle that God has placed on earth to reach people. And it's the best place for all of us to be. I'm sure each of you at times has thought, I could do this on my own much better, much quicker, with a much less b- lot of stress if I didn't have to go to these blinking church meetings and be part of these things. Maybe you haven't, maybe it's just me. <laughs> maybe I'm just earning up to something. But, you know, we've, I'm sure we all have a bit of a mixed relationship with church at times, but church, we are passionate about church and partnership with churches and doing more together than we can do apart. We're passionate about places. And why do we only work in the toughest places? Because there's a whole heap of other people who can work in the affluent places, who can work in the middle class places. We are about finding the places where it's most hopeless, most dark, most difficult, and taking the light of Jesus into those places. Believing passionately that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. We're passionate about team. Trying to do Eden by yourself is really hard. And I know in some places that is pretty much your experience because team has been hard to come by or team has moved on or team has changed. And I know it's not perfect in every place and I really wish it was. And if I could, if I could fix that, because I'm a fixer, <laughs> I'd really love to have you all in healthy, growing, functional, amazing teams. But Sadly, we're humans and teams can be difficult and challenging and fluid and flaky and everything else. But we want to be about team. We want to be about building team. When me and Steve first moved to Merseybank, we had this open evening at a pub just around the corner from where the estate is. And Matt Wilson came along, he used to run Eden, and we had like 20 people who all came from our church, and they were all our pals, and they were all the same age and stage of us, and we were like, we're going to be a team, and it's going to be amazing, and we will like, take this estate for Jesus, and we'd committed to moving, like, I think we'd even moved in, I think we weren't, oh, if we hadn't, we'd signed on a house anyway. And uh, over the course of maybe the next week or two weeks, all of our friends just kind of stopped answering the phone to us and they gave us like all these excuses as to why they couldn't move. Some of them were probably valid, but at the time I didn't take it well. And and that was really frustrating because I was like, God, I I could see this team was going to be brilliant. And we were going to have a lovely time. No, Sam, wait, there's a, it's, it's going to get better. Don't worry, I'm not slating you, promise. I, I had my my mind what team was going to be. And then what really happened was that God just brought all these other people to us, people who'd been on the estate all along, just praying quietly, just faithfully serving him, who suddenly got excited that there was something fresh happening. People who were hundreds of miles away, living a quiet life by the seaside, who got the call to come up to Manchester. People who weren't even Christians when we moved onto the estate, who've come to faith, who are now key parts of everything that we do. So... Team can be frustrating, team can be hard, team definitely isn't always what we think it should be in our heads, but my experience has been that God crafts team and that he brings all manner of people together to to reach community and that, and it doesn't happen neatly and nicely and in a packaged way, but that's just been my experience thus far. And The people that join our teams, we talk about three different types of people. And it might be that you identify yourself in one of these categories. I'd hope they they sort of cover most of us. And originally, when we first sent people, it was all about relocators, people who moved in. And we used to use the language of moving in, of living sacrificially, because you could probably afford to live somewhere else, but you chose not to. And of, of kind of making this movement and this step into community. And then we talked about people who returned back to their community of origin. So maybe they'd grown up somewhere and they were the ones who got out, who went to uni or got a great job or just managed to get out of the the community that they'd been part of. But then God's called them back. And then there were the remainers, people who've always been there. Maybe people who've become Christians through the work of Eden or other churches and they've decided not to move 
but just to stay put and to be consistently, persistently committed to that community. And more often than not, actually, today, the people who are joining Eden are those people. They're remaining in their communities. They're choosing to repurpose their time. They're choosing to reimagine what mission looks like. They're choosing to join in with us in things like this. Um, And to say they want to reach their communities because they've got a story that's been lived out in that place. People have seen their mess. People have seen their mistakes. And people have seen firsthand the transformation that God has brought. And so teams can be made up of all types of people. And you might identify um, as a different, in any one of those three groups. And I think it's probably useful to think a little bit about that in your team. And again, I've got a few questions around that. Question one, who would you say that you are when it comes to an Eden person? Are you a relocator? Are you a remainer? Are you a returner? I want to really work hard as we lead this movement to shift our language so we're not always assuming that everyone relocates and chooses to move into a community. But we're equally as mindful that many people choose to stay put. Many people choose to live long-term, generation upon generation. And I think we've got some fantastic teams where we can see the evidence of that. Um, So it's something that I'd love us to work on in the coming years. How can we help you better? If that's you, if you've joined Eden from where you already are, how can we help you? What are we missing? What are we not seeing? I know I'm a relocator, so I need teaching and I need... Um, input from you so help me why does it matter that was the question you can ask yourself how you come into Eden why does it matter and how does it affect your engagement with the network and your work in your community Harvey Conn and Manuel Ortiz say this the most difficult step for many missionaries and urban church planters to take is to rearrange their lives Jesus rearranged his life for us And it's imperative that we rearrange our lives for the people he died for. Whether you relocate, return or remain, you need to rearrange your life to make time for people. You can't go on living as you did before if you're going to be part of Eden. You can't go on being super busy, having a a diary that only works on an appointment basis because that's not how communities work. You need flexibility built into your schedule. You need to walk around your community. You need to use public transport. You need to use the local shops. Please try and use the local schools and the local health centres if you can. I know that can be a challenge. My doctor's CQC rating is very low. He is not a great doctor. He does not believe mental health is a thing. Go figure. But, you know, we need to rearrange sometimes and let go of some of the things in life that we've hold, held on to preciously. Final two things that we do is we do youth work and I think that's something that's changed as well over the years. We were primarily and exclusively a youth movement in the early days and that has broadened out because we know in our communities that the young people are key but they've got parents and grandparents, they've got little sisters and little brothers and nieces and nephews and cousins and so We don't want to exclusively just go for the young people and miss out on the others. We want to try and reach the whole of communities, but we know youth is key. Because if you can get to a young person before it goes totally wrong, you've got so much more opportunity of changing their whole life and impacting their family. I haven't really got time to go through all the distinctives, but I'll just give you a headline on each of them. This is how we do what we do. Number one, incarnational. The incarnation was Jesus' move from heaven to earth, very much speaks into the relocator language, and it's something we need to look at. But it's about giving of yourself. It's about putting off perspectives. and um, It's a little bit like what I was just saying, rearranging your life for the benefit of the community rather than for, for the good of yourself. Relational. It's about getting vulnerable with people. It's about getting alongside people. It's also about the relationships in your team. You need to be trusting your team. You need to be vulnerable in your team. You need to have the ability to argue in your team. We used to have one argument in our team, pretty much the same argument. We used to have it on a regular basis. And we knew, like me and Steve, could look at each other um, in the room. It was always during the prayer time as well. Uh, that we'd have the same argument. But we, but we still loved each other. We didn't fall out. We didn't, I mean, sometimes we fell out. And it's sometimes we got annoyed with each other. But 
But we need to be able to argue and, and trust that with our arguing, we're still going to love each other. We're still going to do um, God's work. Purposeful. We need to be intentional. I talk about being intentional in supporting your community, intentional about having time, intentional about having flexibility. We need to be purposeful when it comes to prayer as well in our communities. I heard a great talk this morning from one of the MSE students, formerly the Academy. Um, young girl, first one up uh, to talk to the message, and she just talked really well about prayer. And she said, prayer needs to be strategic and it needs to be sponta- spontaneous. Spontaneous. <laughs> spontaneous. Um, strategic. You do it every day. You do it regularly. You're in a pattern of doing it so that it's a, it's a discipline but also spontaneous. At times, you just give more time over to prayer. At times, you pray differently. At times, you pray joyful prayers. At times, you pray prayers of lament. You need to have both, but be purposeful. Get those disciplines in place. Praying together, eating together, fasting. No one loves fasting, but powerful things shift when we fast. And God isn't just about drudgery in service he's about breakthrough and sometimes when we submit ourselves to him we can see that breakthrough in a greater measure countercultural kingdom culture we're not bringing a middle class culture to our communities and fixing them and getting them to you know do eat healthily or uh, you know get married if they're not married or bring up kids in a certain way that's not what the gospel is about like it's about pointing people to Jesus and helping them to follow him and be authentically themselves, but authentically in relationship with him as he guides them and he leads them and he puts them back together in the way that he wants to, not the way that we'd like to. And I still struggle with that today, honestly. I'm sure many of us do. And finally, holistic. Sorry, I know I talk fast. Um, But we're about the business of transforming whole communities. And sometimes... That's about getting involved in stuff. We had Laura Nielsen come and speak to us at Proximity at, proximity, at Formation uh, back in June. And she talked to us about how she was so horrified with the healthcare in her community as a doctor, not just as like a regular patient. So she took on the healthcare centre and she started to work to make that healthcare better for her community. And then she broadened that out and opened a whole a whole heap of healthcare centres. I mean, she's pretty extraordinary. That's not like an average example. Like, but, but holistically changing uh, things so that our communities are better for people. We want to be about that kind of stuff. It's a marathon and it requires us to shift our perspective, but it's so worth doing. And I just want to encourage you for the year ahead. If you get chance in your teams, uh, read Luke 10 again, especially verses 1 to 11, the sending out of the 72, uh, because I think it's really helpful as a framework of mission, not taking all of our wisdom and expertise and stuff, but just being vulnerably ourselves to our community, living alongside the good and the bad, but committing to stay put as long as there is uh, God's spirit telling you to stay put there, praying for peace, declaring the kingdom to come, eating and drinking, whatever is given to you and seeing people healed, freed and delivered. There's lots more I could say but I just want to read this little letter that was sent to us a little while back from somebody who used to be part of Eden and she says this. When we were able to get back together at Message HQ for proximity this year something in my soul breathed a sigh of relief after being away for so long due to covid Here I was, finally back with my tribe. People who had heard the call of Jesus to love young people and a specific patch of soil so deeply that you'd never fully understand anyone who hadn't heard it too. Here I was, back with people who wanted to be part of the kingdom of God, breaking through into places that others said were God-forsaken. People who called their communities home, Because that estate and the people in it were quickly becoming their kith. The people somewhere between friends and family that we're connected to because of our choices. Here I was, back in a place that felt thin because of years of prayer and worship poured out in that space and my soul breathed deeply. When I joined Eden back in 2009, the message had just dipped its toe out of Manchester to set up the first team in Sheffield. We could just about fit the whole organisation into a small meeting room. 
It's been incredible to be part of Eden and the message as it's become the movement that has spread across the globe. We are a movement of people, so it hasn't all been plain sailing and there have been a lot of sharp learning curves along the way. To those of you who are perhaps new to Eden or feeling unsure about this partnership, let me say that these 13 years of being in the Eden tribe have taught me that these people are worth journeying with. When things get hard on your estate, when people and situations leave you feeling broken or misunderstood, here are a group of people who get you, who get your heart and want to sit with you in the pain, make you a cup of tea and cheer you on for the next season. We have been called to be part of this upside down kingdom, this Jesus freak movement, this wild goose, Holy Spirit led faith and doing that alone is hard too hard in my opinion we need each other thank you Eden for being the tribe I longed for and keeping me faithful to my calling and then she says some other stuff but I just thought that kind of exemplifies who I hope you feel us to be a tribe of people who sharpen each other and support each other and keep each other true to the calling that God has yeah it's different for each of us because we're a different church we're a different community we've got different skills and gifts but I hope that together as we do this thing as we work it out as we wrestle and challenge we'll find strength we'll find joy and we'll find encouragement to keep us going I have gone quite a lot over what I meant to do um so what I suggest we do is we finish the live stream I'll pray for us and then if there's any questions in the room I'm happy to take those for the next couple of well 10 minutes or so um, and then we will call it a night uh, if you've got questions online and you've put them on the chat I'll get back to you I know who you all are anyway hopefully um, and if I don't hi welcome um, and we'll try and do it that way okay let me just pray as we finish uh, the, the streaming bit Lord, thank you for the privilege of leading these guys and, and being part of this movement which predates all of us because it's from you. And uh, God, as we seek to see kingdom transformation in our communities, as we pour out our lives um, on the altars of our streets and the altars of our estates, God, I pray uh, just that you help us be more flexible, you help us be more open and you help us be more connected to you as we do that. Lord, I pray that we would find you anew in the faces of everyone that we meet this week. I pray we'd hear your voice afresh as we listen uh, to what you have to say to us through your word and through people. And I just bless each and every person who's listening in now. I pray that there's been something that has challenged them and something that has encouraged them and something that you've spoken direct to their heart that's going to help them in the coming weeks, months and year ahead. In your name I pray. Amen. Super.